Hi guys, welcome back to Exmo Lex. Today I want to talk to you about con man, murderer, and former Mormon Mark Hoffman. I never knew or heard about Mark Hoffman until I started questioning the church, but the whole story is pretty fascinating and there are still a lot of things I didn't know about it until I decided to really look into it further. The famous salamander letter wasn't the first time Mark Hoffman duped the LDS church. So if you've ever been interested in this story or you like learning about crime, or if you want to hear about how an RM conned the LDS church into paying tens of thousands of dollars for forged documents, stay tuned. Mark Hoffman was born in 1954 in Salt Lake City, Utah, and was the son of two devoutly religious Mormons. In fact, he was a sixth generation Mormon. He was raised in the church, and when the time came, he served a two-year mission in England. He ended up converting several people into the church, but one of his former girlfriends claimed that he lost his faith before he ever went on a mission, and that he really only went because of social pressure and he didn't want to disappoint his parents. Regardless of whether or not a person loses their faith in the church, it's actually super common for missionaries to only really go on a mission because they feel immense social pressure from their friends and family and ward members. I've talked about it before in other videos about missions, so I'll leave some links in the description. Hoffman was a con artist from a young age. When he was a teenager, he got really into coin collecting. He forged a rare mint mark on a dime and then was told by an organization of coin collectors that it was genuine. This would have been one of the first times, if not the first time, that he did something like this and got away with it. In 1980, Mark Hoffman claimed to have found a 17th century King James Bible with a folded paper inside. I want to get all my facts right, so I'm going to read a little bit here. The paper appeared to be a transcript that Joseph Smith's scribe Martin Harris had presented to Charles Anthon, a Columbia Classics professor, in 1828. According to Joseph Smith's history and the Pearl of Great Price, the transcript and its reformed Egyptian characters were copied by Smith from the Golden Plates, from which he translated the Book of Mormon. Now, in reality, Hoffman had constructed a fake King James Version, which he had made to look like Charles Anthon's description of the document. However, experts concluded that the document was legitimate. The LDS Church announced the discovery of the Anthon transcript in April 1980 and, get this, purchased the fake document from Mark Hoffman for more than $20,000 which, taking inflation into account, would be more than $60,000 today. After that, Mark Hoffman went into business as a rare book dealer and started forging more documents. I mean, he got away with it, so in his mind, why not? He fooled not only the regular members of the church, but also the highest governing body in the church, the First Presidency, and document experts and historians. I expect that if he'd managed to fool all those people, he'd be feeling pretty slick. A year later, in 1981, Hoffman showed up at church headquarters again. This time, he had a document that claimed that Joseph Smith had actually chosen his son, Joseph Smith III, to be the next prophet of the church, not Brigham Young. Now, this fake letter was apparently written by Mormon pioneer Thomas Bullock and dated January 27, 1865. In the letter, Bullock chastised Brigham for having all the copies of Joseph Smith III's blessing destroyed and writing that he believed Young to be the legitimate leader of the LDS Church, but he would still keep his copy of the blessing. We know now that the letter is fake, but had it been legitimate, it would have portrayed not only Brigham Young, but the LDS Church in a very negative light. Hoffman tried to sell the letter to the chief archivist of the church, but he was turned down because of his high asking price. So then he offered it to the Reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, or the RLDS Church, which is an offshoot of the LDS Church that always claimed that the line of succession should have gone, or actually did go, not to Brigham Young, but to Joseph Smith's son, Joseph Smith III. As I'm sure you guys can guess, both churches were then scrambling to acquire the document. And Hoffman, posing as a faithful Latter-day Saint, then presented the document to his church, the Mormon Church, in exchange for items worth more than $20,000. But he also ensured that the document would become public knowledge. The day after giving the church the document, the New York Times printed a headline that said, Mormon document raises doubts on succession of church's leaders, and the LDS Church then had to confirm the discovery and later publicly presented the document to the RLDS church. As you can see, the documents that Mark Hoffman was forging were made in a way to put the church in a negative light. So a few years after Joseph Smith III's blessing, fake blessing, was discovered, the salamander letter appeared. 
It was supposedly written by Martin Harris to an early Mormon convert named W.W. Phelps. The letter presented a very different version of the recovery of the golden plates than the one the LDS church had. The forgery stated that Joseph Smith had been money digging using magical practices, and instead of an angel, Angel Moroni, appearing to Joseph, it was a white salamander, which is where the letter gets its name. The letter was offered to several different parties, including Gerald and Sandra Tanner, prominent critics of Mormonism. And even though the letter actually supported the Tanner's claims against the church, they doubted its authenticity and did not purchase it. A deal with the LDS church was also not reached, so Hoffman finally sold the letter to another Mormon, Stephen F. Christensen, on January 6, 1984, for $40,000. Christensen wanted to try to authenticate the document so that he could donate it to the LDS church. Over a year later, on April 28, 1985, the LDS church revealed the contents of the Salamander letter. Around that time, the church also released a letter to its high school seminary program that said seminary teachers should not encourage debate about the Salamander letter, but that they should tactfully answer genuine questions on the subject. Farms, a research group composed of LDS scholars, published several articles which examined the Salamander letter, such as, why might a person in 1830 connect an angel with a salamander? Which leads to a particularly famous part of this story. After the salamander letter became public, Apostle Dallin H. Oaks asserted that the white salamander could be reconciled with Joseph Smith's angel Moroni because in the 1820s the word salamander might refer to a mythical being thought to be able to live in fire. And being that is able to live in fire is a good approximation of the description Joseph Smith gave of the angel Moroni. Yep. This is a perfect example of confirmation bias. The tendency to interpret new evidence as confirmation of one's existing beliefs. Dallin Oaks saw this letter, believed it was true even though it was a complete fabrication, and found a way not only to make it make sense, but also confirm his prior beliefs. Now, no one knows for sure how many forged documents Mark Hoffman created, but they included a fake letter from Joseph Smith's mother describing the origin of the Book of Mormon, a fake letter each from Martin Harris and David Whitmer, each giving a personal account of their visions, a fake contract between Joseph Smith and Egbert Brett Grandin for the printing of the first edition of the Book of Mormon, and two pages of the original Book of Mormon manuscript taken in dictation from Joseph Smith by Oliver Cowdery. In 1983, Hoffman sold the church through Gordon B. Hinckley a forged letter from 1825, supposedly from Joseph Smith confirming that he had been treasure hunting and practicing black magic for five years following the first vision. Hoffman had the signature confirmed as authentic and sold it to the church for $15,000. He also gave his word that no one else had a copy of the letter. But you can't trust a con artist. Hoffman leaked it to the press, after which the church was forced to release the letter to scholars for study, despite the fact that they had previously denied having the letter in their possession. Plus one for being honest with your fellow man. Now, this all sounds ridiculous, right? Why would anybody believe Hoffman? He was only about 30 years old at the time, and all of a sudden he's finding these super old, super important Mormon documents. Well, the way he explained it, he had a whole network of tipsters who had methodically tracked down modern descendants of early Mormons and had gone through collections of 19th century letters that had been saved by collectors for their postmarks rather than for their contents. And it wasn't just Mormon documents that he supposedly found. He also forged many documents and signatures of famous non-Mormons like George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, John Quincy Adams, Paul Revere, Mark Twain, and many others. Now, eventually, people did start to get suspicious. I mean, how could you not? One man discovering so many astounding documents so quickly. And now, the famous end to the story. In 1985, Mark Hoffman was in debt. Although he'd been selling his forged documents for a lot of money, he was also living a lavish lifestyle. And he had purchased many genuine first edition books. He owed a lot of people a lot of money, and he was starting to feel the pressure. And the salamander letter that he had previously forged was starting to gather a lot of attention and suspicion as to its authenticity. So, in an apparent effort to buy himself more time, he decided to commit a bombing spree. 
On October 15, 1985, Hoffman sent the first bomb to Stephen Christensen, the man who had purchased the Salamander letter. Christensen was killed, and later the same day, a second bomb killed Kathy Sheets, who was the wife of Christensen's former employer. Hoffman sent the bombs as a diversion to draw off investigators by causing them to focus on unrelated business dealings between Christensen and Sheets' husband. And it worked! At first, police initially suspected that the bombings were related to the impending collapse of an investment business, of which Kathy Sheets' husband, J. Gary Sheets, was the principal and Stephen Christensen was his protege. The next day, Mark Hoffman was seriously injured when another bomb that he had made exploded in his car. He suffered numerous injuries, including gashes on his face and chest, burns, and a missing finger and kneecap. He was rescued by some bystanders and taken to a hospital. Hoffman initially tried to fool investigators by making it sound like he had been targeted to be bombed and then describing a man that he thought had been following him. But once the investigators looked at the remains of the bomb, his car, and learned about Hoffman's business dealings with Christensen and Sheets, they realized that Hoffman was the perpetrator, not a target. And then once Hoffman was under investigation, his home was searched and the police found evidence of his forgeries. In February 1986, Hoffman was arrested for murder and forgery. He eventually pled guilty and was sentenced to five years to life in prison, went to prison, and is still in prison to this day. Over the years, Hoffman was recognized as one of the most accomplished forgers in American history. Collectors continued to buy his forgeries as if they were genuine even until the late 90s. In August 1987, Mormon Apostle Dallin Oaks believed that the church had witnessed some of the most intense LDS church bashing since the turn of the 20th century. A Mormonism student, Jan Ships, agreed with Oaks, citing that press reports, quote, contained an astonishing amount of innuendo associating Hoffman's plagiarism with Mormon beginnings. Myriad reports alleged secrecy and cover-up on the part of the LDS general authorities, and not a few writers referred to the way in which a culture that rests on found scripture is particularly vulnerable to the offerings of con artists. I found this interesting because the way that Mark Hoffman offered these forgeries to the church and the church believed that they were real and bought them definitely holds similarities to when a group of men sent the Kinderhook plates to Joseph Smith and he believed they were authentic and even translated a portion of them. And those were generally believed by the LDS church to be authentic until 1980 when scientific testing proved that they were not of ancient origin. I do wonder how long it would have taken for Hoffman's forgeries to be discovered if he hadn't overdone it to the point of drawing suspicion and then ended up taking people's lives in an attempt to cover it up. In 1987, the church released an official statement about the whole affair. It said, We are often asked, have these document scandals rocked the foundations of the church, as some writers have trumpeted? Of course they have not. Now that we know the truth about these documents, the events of the last two years have in no way undermined the traditional history of the church. Of course, the foundation of the church has always been extremely rocky, and a few fake documents don't make much of a difference in my opinion. The thing that I feel like does rock the church is that none of the apostles or the prophet were able to figure out that Mark Hoffman was a con artist and an evil man before he ended up committing murder. They were fooled multiple times. They even met in person with Mark Hoffman. And these men, who call themselves prophets, seers, and revelators, didn't see through his deception? He clearly had bad intentions. He clearly wasn't a good person. The church even spent tens of thousands of dollars buying fake documents from him. The LDS church actually teaches about the so-called gift of discernment. In the scriptures, it means to know or understand something through the power of the Spirit. It includes perceiving the true character of people. Apostle David A. Bednar taught that the gift of discernment can help us detect hidden error and evil in others. And these spiritual leaders never caught wind of it? a true prophet would have known. And I mean, surely they prayed about the authenticity of the documents? They ask us to pray over questions, decisions, etc. Don't they do that too? Why wouldn't God tell his own prophet about a man who was out to deceive the church and make it look bad and then commit murder? Especially if they were having personal contact with that man. Could it be because they're not a true prophet? Let me know what you think in the comments.
Thank you guys so much for watching and subscribe if you want to see more of this content. A special thank you to my patrons. You guys are so amazing. Thank you for supporting me. I really appreciate it. And a big special thank you to at Kegar, Craig Call, Jake Nunyabiz, and Melissa Jane for supporting my channel at the Demon Tier on Patreon. I love you guys. Remember to like, comment, subscribe, share, and I will see you guys next time.